It is. It is. I'm <laughs> watching everyone catching their Ubers to the airport. So. I know. Especially tough on us. Just the long weekend early. Uh, good. Okay, we have an intimate audience today, and we might have other stragglers coming in. Um, so my name is Kevin Petrie. I'm with Eckerson Group. I will briefly introduce Joey and then assist with Q&A. Obviously, we're small. I think we do have some people dialing in as well. So if you have questions during or and during the final, say, 10, 15 minutes, let me know. I will bring a uh, microphone to you. Um, so some highlights here from Joey Jablonski and his background. He's VP of Analytics at Pythian. Um, he leads strategic engagements, assisting customers in developing their data strategy. Um, Joey has 20 plus years of experience in software engineering, soft, uh, high performance computing, cybersecurity, data governance, and data engineering. Uh, he has been VP of product at Manifold. He's also held executive positions at Northwestern Mutual, iHeartMedia, and Cloud Technology Partners. A rich, varied background, very relevant to the discussion today. So Joey, let me hand over to you. Great. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. I, uh, there was an interesting conversation yesterday after lunch about how having that after lunch session is the absolute worst because everyone's full, they want to take a nap. I fundamentally disagree and I'm going to back it up with data today. Having the last one at the, uh, the conference is probably the worst. But uh, certainly appreciate everyone who joined. Um, as, as Kevin mentioned, if you have questions, like raise your hand, throw stuff. Uh, folks online, appreciate you joining in virtually. Um, I know I've got a few friends on. I appreciate you giving me a little bit of time this afternoon as well in your day jobs. But we'll, uh, we'll make sure we leave time for questions. So as was mentioned, I'm VP of Analytics at Pythian. Pythian's a data and analytics services firm. We build data platforms for our customers. We help identify and organize around their data strategy. We help build data governance programs and tooling. We have a data science team for doing modeling. Um, and then there's this thing called generative AI that everyone's talking about. So we've got some folks that do that kind of stuff as well. Uh, but I've uh, been doing this for quite a while. In addition to my day job at Pythian, I sit on the Cyber and Analytics Board of Advisors for the University of Texas San Antonio. So in addition to helping customers build data platforms and use data more effectively, I spend a lot of time on curriculum and that next generation of practitioners, particularly in the cyberspace. How do we get them better skills, better analytical capabilities so they can come out and be more effective in their roles? So, <clears throat> so today's conversation is around MLOps. You know, we hear a lot around generative AI and how it's going to change the world. We hear a lot about data science and different types of analytical models. What we don't hear enough about is how do we operationalize this in our organization? What skills do we need? What people? What tools? Where do we get those tools? So that we can take all that really good work that our data science teams do and implement it in a way that we can actually leverage it in the organization. So I always like to start with the, the kind of you know, incorrect question that a lot of organizations say of, well, I have a data scientist, he built a model, don't we just deploy it into our application framework? Like we have this Kubernetes thing, we have this API gateway, and then the data scientist can move on to the next thing. And it's an interesting theory that does not play out in practice. You know, the two places that I see a lot of challenges with that treating models like traditional software is, one is wasting my data science team's time. Like, the inevitable problems of network connectivity. Well, the model can't talk to the database, the user can't get to it from their system, or the uh, things that come into play around model performance, reliability of the infrastructure. So our poor data scientists are stuff, stuck debugging this infrastructure that's A, not built for them, and B, not supporting their needs. Second challenge we have is, as your data science teams get better at their role, they're going to experiment. And you get to organizations where they're running tens or hundreds of experiments at any given time. My data scientists are smart. They have PhDs. One of them teaches at Berkeley. But nobody remembers that much stuff. You certainly don't know which of the experiments from three weeks ago were effective. So MLOps is partially about making sure that those models are reliable, they're available, they're feeding whatever business process they're part of. But secondarily, it's making sure that as we experiment, we are automating that process of 
experiments that failed, experiments that passed, keeping those results for future analysis, and then making sure that if we have models that are failing in production, we get them out quickly. Make sure we're redirecting users to data and outputs that we trust. So MLOps is about making sure our teams are focused on important things. If we train them to be a data scientist, let's have them focusing on being a data scientist. And then managing all that complexity, keeping that record of time of what goes on, models, user impact. But it's not just that. Other things that our MLOps environment has to do and has to be effective. So we've got to detect bias. We've got to engage and manage bias in our environment. This is a growing challenge as our data sets get more complex, as user behavior becomes different and varied over time. We've got to manage that bias. We've got to manage the versioning of models that are going out the door. It's not just the experimentation. Are they good? Are they right? It's just that usual evolution of models going out the door, which users are connecting to them, where are they deployed geographically, what devices are they deployed on. Uh, in a world where we've only got one or two models, this is pretty easy, but you get to a complex organization today that's got a mix between e-com and presence, hundreds or thousands of models are driving that user experience every time they click on the website. Model performance is a key piece. We've got to make sure that we're measuring the responsiveness, the accuracy. We just need to make sure things don't drift. If we define a window of what good looks like, we want to make sure we're not moving outside of that more than is absolutely possible. And then finally, experimentation tracking, as we mentioned. And it's not just the tracking of, I have two models, they're going to a different user population. What sort of heuristics are we seeing from those? It's all of that orchestration on the back end. It's routing of user requests. You know, which users do we want to go to which version of the model? How do we want to store those results in a way that they're queryable, they're reporting on a regular basis? So as we're building out this MLOps infrastructure, we're thinking about both the data that we're tracking, but also that orchestration. How are our models deployed? Who's getting to access them? So who's the standard here? I always like to bring in proxies because the vast majority of us work at organizations where we don't have to invent this stuff from scratch. We'd like to be a cool little science project, be good on a resume, but from a practicality of time investment and organizational uh, priorities, a lot of these capabilities are out there. They're in the market. Um, when it comes to MLOps, kind of orchestrating models at scale, very tightly coupled with user feedback, I tend to look at Google and Facebook as the gold standard. They have a very high level of maturity for the tooling. They have a very high level of maturity in their process. And they have a very high level of maturity in the people that are executing those. And it shows every day. You know, how many of us have a Google phone? How many of us are using Facebook to connect with our families? And we see that real world. We see a variance in behavior over time. When features don't work out as planned, we see them get scrapped relatively quickly. It's because they've got these tools on the back end to provide this level of visibility. Yeah, go for it, Kevin. Quick clarification. So when you say Google, you're saying how Google handles their own ML mm -hmm. models internally. Is that correct? Correct, they yeah. Actually got an extra proxy. They do, and you're actually reading ahead in the slides, okay. which is good. But yeah, this is, I, I when organizations go down their own path of setting up their ML ops team, hiring their ML engineers, I tend to look at the Google and the Facebooks as a proxy for what are operational models that work? What characteristics can we pull? What sort of hiring? What sort of skills can we pull? But I also like to caveat that with several things. They've been doing this a really long time. There's no silver bullet for your organization to go from zero to 100 with ML ops. It's a phased maturity. We'll talk about a little bit later what are the common steps. So just be patient. Like as you start to invest in your team, as you invest in tooling, think about what's the right timeline, what's the right trajectory. Um, they have massive engineering teams. Like the number of MLEs at these organizations is astronomical. And even if you're well-funded, even if your executive champion is going to bat with you for, uh, for HR and for budgeting cycles, you're probably not gonna have that large of an engineering team overnight. Start small, iterate, get good, prove that you're getting better at this, and then go grow the team. Their tooling built in conjunction as the organization scaled. And I recommend you do something similar with your own organization. Don't go out and buy four or five different vendors worth of ML tooling and then go hire your first MLE. 
stair step. Bring in some tooling, let your team get good at it, bring in some more tooling, let them get better at using that tooling. Um, that way you're not overwhelming the team trying to learn a tool while they're defining a process and trying to grow their own skills. And conversely, you're not leaving people out in the wind that are highly capable without augmenting them with technology. Uh, put the right level of risk management around your regulatory and your compliance needs. I have customers that are banking and financial services, very high level of scrutiny. I have customers that are retail institutions, scrutiny, but a little bit lower. And then I have customers that manufacture plumbing parts. No compliance obligations whatsoever. <laughs> Take the appropriate level of regulatory compliance and apply it to what you're doing. Um, don't try to boil the ocean, particularly with some of the regulatory compliance stuff. If you can start your MLOps project focusing on analytical models that are maybe not part of your Sarbanes-Oxley requirements, like just makes life a little bit easier as the team gets good at this. Uh, and then make things reusable from the start. You know, this is something they did very well at the scale at the big players. Um, they built tools that could be reused across the organization. They thought about that reusability up front. I encourage you and your own organizations, take that same thought process. You know, what can we build for one discrete use, one discrete analytical model, but in a way that it's published internally, other teams can consume it, can take advantage of that. So we can hopefully, hopefully, not build up individual silos across the organization in unpredictable ways. So kind of an eye chart, um, and these slides I can, I can publish them so folks have it. At the end of the day though, when you start to define your own MLOps processes, that is, what is the life cycle of a model that gets deployed, that gets measured, that gets managed? How do we retire that? How do we then retrain that model? All of these individual steps within your own organization, it's important that you think about what matters for you. What checkpoints do we need? What level of automated verification is appropriate versus what level of manual verification is appropriate? And build the process that works for you. But thinking about where in the process does bias detection fit? Where in the process do we track our experiments? Where in the process do we do versioning? Where do we do model management? So building those in as you start, even if you don't implement them right away, think about what that process is gonna be. Start with that definition early. So feeding to Kevin's question early, earlier, but do we really wanna build all of this from scratch? And the short answer is no. None of us have engineering teams that are big enough. None of us are gonna be able to articulate the value to our executive team of why we're reinventing the wheel. None of us are gonna be able to go hire the people that have the right experience to do it right the first time, which means we're probably gonna invest in doing it multiple times. This is where we come into the hyperscalers, the Googles, the AWSs, the Azures of the world. They have what I think are pretty good tooling, pretty good infrastructure. You can define your own process what are the steps that a model goes through to get trained, to get tested, to get released, but you don't have to build that orchestration framework. You don't have to build those tests. You don't have to worry about the packaging of the model. They've got frameworks that do it. Comes up fairly often, talking to customers, talking to random friends. You know, is this a place where we go with the cloud vendor native tool? Is this a place where we go buy one of the dozens of very solid vendors that are on the market? And my general recommendation is pick one and get really, really good at it. If you decide as an organization that, hey, we're already in Google, ergo we're gonna go with Vertex AI, that's a perfectly acceptable path because you can build an operational model around it. You can train your people to be really good at those tools. And if there are feature gaps, you can fill the feature gap with custom development, not building the end-to-end -end piece. Conversely, if you're an organization that's deep into AWS, you've got lots of good AWS people, go down the SageMaker path. All of them are capable technology. It's about coupling your own operational model with the technology that's there. So then we see the sampling of the vendor landscape. Um, the ML ops space is a wash with tools. And I tend to put them in two categories. I tend to put them in the category of holistic tooling, that is, We'll orchestrate and manage models end to end, very similar to what the hyperscalers give you on their cloud platform. And then there are these niche MLOps vendors. They've identified one specific feature that's missing and said, we're gonna go in there. 
If you're going to invest in tooling here, the holistic platforms are a much better one because you just need fewer tools in your environment, less integration challenge. My gut feeling is a lot of these niche one solution vendors are gonna get circumvented, taken over by one of the bigger vendors and just kind of their value is gonna be shorter lived than others. So. so we've talked about technology, we've talked about uh, process. What about our people in this organization? And that is important. So we're going to talk a little bit about what are some of the stages that we need to think about and then organizationally, how do we think about building this team? First is how do you do experimentation as an organization? And experimentation varies a lot based on your industry, your geographic footprint, just how people consume your models. Are these consumers with mobile devices? Are they office workers that sit in a call center? So this is uh, from the guys over at Neptune AI. This is my kind of standard baseline process for experimentation. We get our data, we label our data, we version that combination. We then put it into a process where we train the model, we evaluate the output, again, tag that model with a version, and then make sure we're grabbing a lot of feedback from that model performance, feeding it back into that early part of the process, and then doing this over and over and over again. So, Define what is your experimentation process, but define it very specific to your data consumers. Identify what type of device are they gonna be using this on, under what conditions, because those are gonna skew our experimentation results. I think one of the best examples was we had a retailer had built a mobile device or mobile application that enabled a Pretty good experience. You could order clothes for your house. You could set them for store pickup. You could set things to be picked up at the store for trying on. Um, so a very good connection between that real world and the digital footprint. They had released a variety of models to make recommendations on uh, styles for the new season. And they did a ton of consumer research. You know, what styles are gonna resonate with what types of past buyers and past history. Um, released these models and got awful response, like just, I mean, click-through rates were terrible, adding it to their cart rates were terrible, people coming into the store to try it on was terrible. And we went and we dug into the situation quite deep with them, we're like, okay, what happened here? Like these, these models should have worked, we had good data. Well, what we found is when they did the experimentation, it was such a short window, we didn't capture the vast majority of our buyers. The vast majority of the buyers really only came to the mobile site a couple times a week. So they ran a 48-hour experiment and by default got a very, very small subset of our customers. So we got data that showed it didn't work, but honestly, the data set was too small to say whether it did or it didn't. These are the important things to consider for your own experimentation lifecycle. How long do we run experiments? Over what segment of our user population so that we're getting enough data to truly determine, is that model accurate? Are we getting real-world feedback? <clears throat> Next, analytical model where it fits the business process. I can't count the number of times where I go into an organization and they say, we want an analytical model that replaces insert gargantuan business process here. When in reality, gargantuan business process is dozens if not hundreds of individual discrete steps, different teams, different data, different systems of record, different swivel chair that people do between systems. This is important because our ML ops environment has to be a reflection of the real operating world that our business functions under. So if we take an analytical model that we've built for pricing prediction, we're going to predict the price that a product is going to sell. That's a very discrete business step. But it fits in a larger context. We probably have someone in the CFO's office that's scratching at it to say, is it enough margin? We probably have someone scratching at it in the sales organization to say, is it competitive against the industry? We probably have someone in the treasury department that's scratching at it to say, is this going to manage our cash flow obligations to be able to manufacture the product? So our ML ops environment doesn't have to simulate the real world, but we need to make sure that there's enough testing going on that that discrete step that we're replacing with an analytical model is being tested as part of this larger prod process. Are we giving the CFO's team enough data out of that model to calculate their margin? 
Are we giving the treasury group enough clarity as to sales distribution to plan cash flow? Are we giving the sales organization enough clarity to go back and say, what are we going to call for the ball for the week, the month, the quarter? So it's important that our ML ops environment is built and structured in a way to accommodate this connection between our business process and the analytical models that are implementing it. <clears throat> All of this is going to take new skills for your organization, a lot of new skills. Um, modern MLEs, machine learning engineers, have this interesting challenge of they need to understand enough data science to debug the models, they need to understand enough computer science to understand how distributed systems operate, they've got to understand enough software engineering to do release management, quality, testing, they need to understand enough about the cloud to deploy their models, pick their right services and vendors, and then enough about systems engineering to figure out why are we having performance problems. Um, so as we go down this path of building our MLOps capabilities, it's not just the technology, it's hiring the right type of people that are going to design it and operate it. So purple squirrel, like easy. We just go to the market, we post a job, we hire someone. Yeah, go for it, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. The, uh, I just wanted to make sure I'm clear on the, the scope. So MLOps can mean production, or it can mean uh, data and feature engineering, and then development as well. Um, the machine learning engineers are more involved in the production stuff, but less so in development. I was struck that you didn't have data scientists there. Are you talking about the full life cycle, or are you focused more on production? So I'm focused on the full life cycle, and we're actually going to talk a little bit later about where the data scientists fit into this. Okay. But yes, the, the MLEs, their dominant role is that production side. It's the, okay, we've engineered our data. We know that it's trustworthy. We've given that data to our data science teams. They've built models and experiments to determine that, yes, we're getting the behavior we are anticipating. Now we need to deploy all of that in a way that it's highly reliable, it's highly predictable. And that's really where this role of an MLE or a purple squirrel comes in of putting all these pieces together and making sure that these other supporting teams are getting the support that they need as part of that deployment process. Fair enough, and I love the purple squirrel. <laughs> that is not a squirrel in my house. I did not ca catch a squirrel and paint in purple. Like, not cool. <laughs> so, yes, you know, the MLE, whereas they become the linchpin for a lot of this production operation, they're not the only one in our organization. We've got our data engineering activities that are very important at the front part of that experimentation process, building those data products. We've got our data scientists that are very important at that middle part of our experimentation process, taking that data, doing the appropriate feature engineering, turning to our models. And then we've got our MLEs, essentially those folks that are operationalizing all of this. You know, the way I tend to think about these three is that the data engineers have to be extraordinarily detail-oriented because the better they are at catching problems with data earlier in the process, the more effective we can alert the business to the data quality problem, get the right checks in place. Our data scientists have to be those folks that are extraordinarily creative, the art of what's possible, throwing out 100 hypotheses and then finding the one or two that are both valuable and impactful to the organization. The MLEs are the ones that are going to then take all of that good work and package it up, automate it in a way that it's highly reliable, it's highly efficient and reusable. The perfect world is that the MLEs then create better tools. They make life better for the data engineers, they make life easier for the data scientists. So what do they do within this world? The way I tend to think about it is our data engineers, they create data products. They take data, they engineer it, they make it easy to consume, they make sure it's complete. Our data scientists are both creating and improving our analytical models in the environment, and our MLEs are creating all of that reusable infrastructure. What do we need in the organization to be effective to scale? As I mentioned before, this is a maturity. This is a set of steps or a set of phases that we're going to go through as an organization. And I, uh, I'm a big fan of maturity models. I'm a big fan of this is a journey, it's not the destination. Um, I'm also a big fan of reusing what's already in the community. So again, Neptune has a good maturity, three steps. I agree with it. Um, the way they tend to look at it and the way I look at it is as we are maturing our organization, step one, level zero is 
we've decided that we are going to do ML ops. We have enough analytical models running in our environment. We need enough consistency that we need to drive a formalized set of programs around establishing our ML ops program. And this is probably highly manual, probably somewhat script driven, probably not well connected between our ML ops and our operations teams, probably not doing frequent releases, probably not doing automation, but that's okay because we're documenting what we're doing, we're building a team that's getting closer. As we move from level zero to one, we start to automate what I'd call the basics. Let's get better at releasing analytical models in a packaged, predictable way. Let's get better at releasing our data pipelines in a packaged, consistent way. Let's get to the point that we can do rapid experimentation, that we can deploy two models, we can test the results of them. That then builds on capability. We're maturing our technology and our people at the same time, so we can get to level two. This is where we're highly repetitive, highly repeatable in all things we do. Our pipelines are being continuously delivered. Our analytical models are continuous. Most important, we also have monitoring and visibility into what's going on. Earlier in our maturity levels, we may just find problems because somebody told us. So we get more mature, we find problems because we knew what to look for. We knew what to anticipate for. We know what good behavior looks like. So as you define your own maturity level, it may not be three steps for your organization. It may be five. You may prioritize certain things. As I mentioned before, if you're a highly regulated institution, that regulatory stuff probably needs to come up into level zero. We probably need to start with that foundational regulatory stuff just so we don't accidentally miss it down the line. I always just, oh, I always describe these as the five truths. You know, the, uh, the idea that things that are immutable in our process that we just have to work around. Um, starting with technology. The technology is going to change. Don't make a tool commitment and say, this is our tool for the next 10 years. Like, the world's gonna change a lot in the next 10 years. Teach your people, train your architecture teams, implement things in a way, and just plan. This tool's gonna get ripped out in two to three years. Whatever tooling we choose, let's plan that it's gonna rotate. Uh, behaviors are gonna have to change, um, particularly in highly regulated environments. I find the idea of multiple models being deployed, different consumers of our data going to different models, very hard concept for compliance teams, traditional data governance teams to wrap their head around. So we've got to change that culture. We've got to get people thinking more iteratively. We've got to get people thinking about where do we deploy these capabilities that manage risk. Um, this is what makes or breaks it for an organization, getting people more willing to change and seeing that it's impactful, it can be done properly. Uh, process, as I mentioned before, don't take gargantuan processes and try to automate the entire thing. Take discrete steps. Make sure your systems and tools are built in a way that they're flexible. One thing we want to avoid manifesting here is Conway's law in that our systems take the form of our organizational structure. Accept that our organizational structure is going to change and our infrastructure is going to have to change with it. Uh, roles and titles are different. And I say this for a very specific reason. You know, I mentioned data engineer, data scientist, and MLE. Three relatively common titles in the community that are applied and hired highly inconsistently across organizations. So as you think about your own organization, think about what are the right roles in your ML ops process? I own part of a release cycle, I own quality standards. And then what are the titles that you're bringing into the organization? and be very crisp about how they work together. How do those teams get put together to get to the right outcome? Uh, I see a lot of organizations get very caught up in the religious definition of a job title or a role in the organization. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if your internal role matches the community. You need a little bit for recruiting reasons, you need a little bit so that people can put on their resume and describe their job. But the specifics of how those roles work together, their accountability to one another, can be specific to your org. And then regulations, as I mentioned. Um, there's places where they're gonna slow us down, there's places where we're gonna stop things we wanna do, but there's a whole host of opportunities that we can go after without having to do that. And I highly recommend, you know, pick, pick workloads, pick use case in your organization that 
avoid the really hard regulatory problems up front and then bring that capability in over time. So where are we going? Where do we get started? Uh, define your operating model. As I mentioned, the one slide, boxes, process and diagrams. Define what your gold standard operating model is. You may not build it all at once. You may not even build all of it ever, but start with what that operating model is, how you want to test models, how you want to release them, how you want to run experiments. Identify and build your skills. This is always a combination of, you need to go out to the market and hire some people that have experience building from the ground up, and then opportunities for people internally, cross-training, up skills, getting them the experience. Build that team that's going to own your MLOps infrastructure and the associated process. Start small. Um, don't plan to build an infrastructure tomorrow that's going to deploy a thousand models. Pick a few analytical models that are in your environment, build the infrastructure around that, and then scale. And then decide on technology. Pick the technology that complements your operating model, your procurement model, your approach to uh, model management. Um, I always put this by design with technology on the last piece. Like a lot of decisions have to be made before we start buying tools. That way we're buying the right ones. We know we can effectively use them. The other challenge in the technology space is that if you look at five different MLOps tools, you're probably going to have like 40% overlap. And you're like, well, no tool does it all, but if I buy these two, I have a bunch of overlapping features, so where do I implement it? And that becomes a really complex Rubik's Cube that you got to figure out as an organization. And you might end up buying a tool and not using all the capability it brings. And that's okay because it's tying up to the operating model that we defined first. So, excellent. What else can I answer? Any questions? Is there any online? <laughs> Actually, I'll check that. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I have a couple questions, but I can let others go first. I mean, as far as you can talk more about like, the ML specification. Yeah. Yeah, just talking more about the ML specific position within data science, data engineering, because I think that's more new to me. Yeah, absolutely. So at the end of the day, as we scale up our data capabilities in an organization, we have several buckets of different work. We have data engineering, kind of sourcing data, doing our feature engineering, preparing it to be consumed. We have the data science piece, kind of the mathematical component of What's the right algorithm to use? How do I apply that algorithm to the data in a way that's meaningful? And then we have the orchestration of all of this stuff, deploying our pipelines, running our pipelines religiously, making sure they're instrumented for monitoring. So we've got what would traditionally be that data engineer role, sourcing data, the data science piece, and then the MLE, that kind of orchestration, reusable component. The Reality is a good data scientist can do both of those other roles, but they probably don't want to because they went down a data science education path, and they're probably not going to be as good at it as hiring specialized skills for the other ones. So what you have to figure out for your organization is, based on the body of work ahead of you, what's the right ratio to get to? So like when I was at iHeartMedia, every one of our data scientists, we targeted having two data engineers. We found that to be the right mix, that our data scientists were not blocked by lack of data, and it becomes a good operating unit. Three people can work as a team, they can do stand-ups, they can coordinate their priorities in a very effective way. I've been at other organizations where I've seen upwards of four to five data engineers per data scientist, and that's what they needed for their organization. The data was more complex, they had more sources. Very similar, your MLEs, you've got to figure out that ratio of how many data scientists, ergo, how many models do we have going out the door? So how many MLEs do we need to help orchestrate that environment for them so they're not getting blocked by the one day on Earth is seven days on Mars problem of just trying to get problems solved and then make sure they've got that effective support on managing experimentation because that, that management and orchestration of the experimentation, that's going to be a lot of the MLEs role as well. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for getting people to center on, on a particular stack? Um, I'm in a situation where various data scientists, uh, global agency, and a lot of people are just working in their own weird little silos, and they've got their own stacks. And you know, how do I incentivize them to, to get onto the same? Yes, yeah, so this, this comes up a lot. I hear, I hear and I read it in a lot of books of for data scientists to be 
maximum impact, they have to have access to all the tools in the community and then they have to choose which ones they use. And I think, I think there's a little bit of truth that we can't, we can't tell all of our data scientists, you will use this tool in this notebook because then there will be problems that they just fundamentally can't fix. There's no tool that can go after all the problem possible domains that a data scientist is on. I tend to find two areas where it works out well that I can, I wouldn't say force some standardization, but drive some better decisions. One is around just the basics of notebooks. Where do I store my notebook? What's my notebook service? What does a standard annotized notebook look like? And that's a pretty easy one because it drives collaboration. It drives this idea that one data scientist may instantiate a new model, but another data scientist is going to have to then go iterate on that in six months when we need to do an update or a feature change. So standardizing them there is kind of a, a small path into we all store our notebooks in the same place, we all use the same standard for notebooks, we all annotize them in the same way because it's necessary for collaboration across the team. So that's one. The second kind of, I don't know if it's a behavior or a cultural dynamic that I found somewhat of success about is holding the data scientists accountable for using the same tool as it relates to the same problem domain if it's been done before. So an example, I have a data scientist and he's doing sentiment analysis on one of our data sets for the first time. I give him a wide amount of latitude to go look at sentiment analysis tools on the market work with his MLE to find which one's going to be capable of being operationalized, and then make a decision. The next time we have a data scientist that's doing a sentiment analysis type problem, we push them very hard in that direction and say, look, having two tools to do sentiment analysis very rarely makes sense. So let's move that we already have a standard for that type of problem domain. And over time, you'll get a library of for these types of problems, we have a set tool that we use. It's not a perfect example, but it, it, it works better than giving them free for all because what ends up happening a lot is that as your data science team grows, they don't even know what problems we've previously solved. So by giving them at least some direction on the tools for the problem domain, hopefully at least gives them the right information to make the right decision and not duplicate capabilities in the, in the building. So. <laughs> So we have a couple of questions from uh, our online viewers. Uh, first one here is, what are some of the leading and proven models that are getting prominence? So I think it, it varies a lot by industry and then where the impact of data science is within the organization. So particularly in the retail space, like, lots of complex neural networks, lots of optimization techniques because that's what we're trying to do. We want to make sure stock's in the right place, targeting customers with the right ads, high propensity to buy, those sorts of things. Um, I think the, we'll say, excitement and passion around LLMs is driving, I would argue, a lot of really good experimentation. Like every organization I've talked to has like some project using LLMs for Maybe we can build chatbots. Maybe we can do internal training tools. So we're seeing a lot of interest and excitement. Um, we have a lot of like enterprise readiness and like compliance scrutiny we got to deal with before we deploy these things. But we're getting there. So <laughs> actually, a follow-up question on that that I had is uh, how much of the of what you just shared applies to language models, and what are special considerations? Maybe you could elaborate more on that because now we're dealing with tokenized text. Yes. Um, ideally, from within a company, they're going to fine tune it on that. Yep. So I think 80% of what I've talked about probably applies. I'm going to argue that the two places where it varies a lot is the data engineering skills are going to be very different from numbers, statistics, sales records, that type of thing the type of skill set a data engineer is going to need for tokenizing text as an example, semantic mapping is going to be fundamentally different. So we've got to think differently about that part of our experimentation process, the skills and the tooling that we need. I think the other place where it's going to heavily affect is the MLEs and how they think about system scalability. Training an analytical model based off of numbers that are going through a variety of you know, formulas 
is a very different computation problem than like retraining from millions of documents. Like very different thought process for how we build pipelines, um, how we then build that data into our model. So I think it's gonna change the MLEs, maybe not skill set, but at least their outlook on the problem. That makes a lot of sense. Um, another question here, <laughs> it kind of sounds like a summary of your presentation in some ways, Excellent. but I'm going to read it and see, see what I'm missing. How can organizations establish robust processes and workflows for managing the end-to-end -end life cycle of machine learning models from development and deployment to monitoring and maintenance? Yep. So maybe it's more I, of a focus on process and workflow than Maybe process and workflow. I, I would point back to the maturity steps. You know, identify, we've got, we've got a foundational model. Three steps of maturity, highly manual but a documented process, somewhat automated for the simple things, and then automated end-to-end, -end, very highly repeatable and measured. Figure out what that means for your organization and invest in the right places. I mean, that's the... I always caution organizations, like when you see maturity models have a good and a bad. Good because they give you a roadmap of like, okay, I did A, now I can do B. But don't get caught up in the, I have to do all the steps in the maturity model. It may very well be that your organization, investment plus complexity plus risk, means that I only need to spend the money to get to maturity level one. I don't need to spend it on two. I don't gain anything on that. So make sure you think about how far you need to go as an organization. Um, and don't go further than that because it's just not, not time well spent, not money well invested. Okay, good. Other questions from the audience? And if not, I have a final one myself. And then we'll let people get out of here because it's And then the we'll end let people the enjoy <laughs> a summer evening. Um, so the final one would be on the regulatory front, Europe is looking at some AI regulation. What should people have on their radar screen as it replies, applies to compliance on the AI front? So we've spent an exorbitant amount of emotional effort over the past 10 to 12 years becoming compliant with GDPR, CCPA, CPRA. All of them are built around the same general concept of me, Joey, I own my data. I can tell you, the company, to delete it, get rid of it. That is my legal right. Well, we're entering a world where a company may very well take my data about me and train a model. And suddenly there's this ghost of Joey floating around in analytical models. Do I as a consumer have the right to tell you, well, both you gotta delete my data and you gotta go back and retrain those models. I don't want any record of me being there or my behavior that could potentially leak even if it's a small insignificant chance. So I think we're going to start to see a clearly stating of you as a consumer, what rights do you have, not just for the data, but any derived models from it, forget, retrain. And that's a, that's a hard technical problem. If I'm doing a, an ad targeting model, I'm retraining it every day anyway. Like pulling Joey out of the training set's easy. But if I have complex LLMs that are pulling in thousands or millions of documents, like retraining is, that's expensive. Like it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's gonna create very unpredictable results in our, in our, in our LLM. So I think, I think the biggest compliance problem we're gonna to have to answer in the coming years is what rights does a user have that maybe their data's gone, but they've been used for training in the past, and what, what implications it means for the organization. Very cool. Yep. Joey, thanks for the insights, and thank you everyone for dialing in and attending in person. Yeah, thanks everybody. We can wrap things up. Thank <laughs> you.